This episode of Movie Night is brought to you by Netflix. Sign up for a free 30-day trial at netflix.com slash jogwheel. Where did this place come from? It wasn't here a few minutes ago. I don't care. Let's see if we can get some directions. Look, there's someone at the door. I am Torgo. I take care of the place while the master is away. Mike, I'm scared. It's getting dark. Well, Torgo, which way is out of here? There is no way out of here. It will be dark soon. There is no way out of here. No way out? Sorry, no. This is it. And this 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 Hello and welcome to the 100th episode of Movie Night, YouTube's most viewed movie review show. I'm your host, Jonathan Paula. During the last four years, we've reviewed over 275 movies together across 19 hours of original content. So thank you very much for watching, whether you subscribed yesterday or in 2009. As a token of my appreciation, I have decided to suffer through some of the worst films of all time. In fact, all five of tonight's pictures are currently in IMDb's bottom 10 lowest rated films ever. We begin with Birdemic, Shock and Terror. Produced on a paltry budget of only 10,000 by independent filmmaker James Nijin, this Alfred Hitchcock-inspired romantic horror film saw limited release in October of 2008, before becoming a cult hit on home video. The extremely poorly made 92-minute feature begins with a long and boring credit sequence that embarrassingly even includes a spelling mistake. The plot, which almost appears to have been filmed in sequence, features an awkward Alan Ba and the attractive Whitney Moore who lead a group of survivors during an unexplained deadly bird invasion outside of San Jose, California. Filmed with jerky follow pans, the unrated movie breaks every fundamental rule of filmmaking, with no regard for basic continuity. Afraid of using L cuts, editor Kim Chow sticks only to vanilla edits that are so poorly timed you could drive a double decker bus through them, only accentuating the abysmal performances and unrealistic behavior by the undeveloped cast. Howdy. Hi. Can you sell me some gas for my truck? Sorry, but we need it. You're gonna sell me some gas now. Oh, take it easy, take it easy. Uh, I got an extra tank in the back. Good, get it. Obviously recorded from a low-quality onboard mic, this movie seriously features the worst audio I've heard in my entire life. Nearly every scene includes random pockets of silence, inaudible dialogue, abrupt changes in room tone, all of it backed by a soundtrack that sounds like a rejected MIDI file from the 1980s. Nijin, meanwhile, is seemingly obsessed with photographing a rented Ford Mustang, and footage that has worse lighting than an iPhone. The story has no grasp on reality. The progression of nonsensical events feels like it was written by a prepubescent boy who just found three foot of dolly track, and needlessly included the repeating camera move throughout. Still frames and pointless dissolves bookend nearly every sequence, many of which are not only head-shakingly awful, but entirely redundant, repeating many images, like that of a bird being shot out of the sky several times over. A bizarrely irrelevant eco-friendly message that cautions about global warming is bluntly forced into the stupid plot late, as if to explain away the presence of the extremely fake-looking flying creatures. Not appearing until over 45 minutes in, the birds are just plastered over the scenery without so much as basic motion tracking, ensuring the laughable effects prevent any plausibility of tension or realism. Even the end credits are mostly fake, as Nijin thought adding a bunch of made-up people would make the film look more professional. 
it doesn't. The only thing scary in this so-called horror film is that it somehow exists at all. With no purpose, reasoning, or resolution, this badly paced movie is one you regret watching immediately. But it's somehow endearing for how honest and terrible it is. You almost feel bad for the folks involved. The incompetent crew clearly had good intentions, but didn't know the first damn thing about making a movie. At least Mrs. Moore is hot in a bikini though, right? Birdemic Shock and Terror. So inexcusably bad, it's impressive. Well, those are my harsh words. Now let's see what you had to say about this film in the YouTube comments. Let's bring in the rate matic which I suppose tonight will be more like the hate o -matic, with our scores for Birdemic, Shock and Terror. Two ones. Lamenting over the awkward acting, but citing the laughable effects as unintentionally entertaining, you thought this movie was garbage. Far too boring to truly qualify as so bad it's good fare. I have to agree, I rate it as garbage as well. Next up tonight is Disaster Movie. From the talentless hacks that brought us disappointing pictures like Spy Hard, Epic Movie, or Meet the Spartans, Jason Friedberg and Aaron Setzer released this magnum opus of garbage in August of 2008, which somehow earned a $14 million profit. The lowest ranked movie of all time on IMDb, this piece of parody direct so egregiously misses the point of entertainment, it is painful and even detrimental to watch, playing out as one long, unfunny joke without a punchline. The PG-13 rated sideshow of nonsense goes beyond unfunny or boring, becoming outright insulting drivel, appealing to the stupidest common denominator. The cast of awful no-name Mad TV has-beens aren't even worth mentioning, except for Los Angeles socialite Kim Kardashian in her feature debut, who showcased better range in her leaked sex tape. With barely any semblance of a plot, the endless string of disconnected shots don't even come close to a disaster-style story. The dismally paced movie has no rhyme or reason to the dozens of disposable references and sight gags littered so haphazardly throughout. The offensive, crude, and immature jokes wouldn't even be amusing to brain-dead children. The pointlessly irrelevant cameos and celebrity impressions lack any humor, criticism, or subtlety, bursting into shots by literally announcing themselves. It's me, Dr. Phil, one bald guy quips. I didn't have a than sex with a camel. <laughs> oh, we're just playing with my monkey. <laughs> In an attempt to stay fiercely topical and current, many characters spoof unreleased movies, pathetically written based only on their source material's trailers, resulting rather ironically in a picture that aged terribly, already feeling extremely dated for a five-year-old comedy. The list of pop culture items spoofed includes Indiana Jones, Amy Winehouse, Sex and the City, a number of superheroes, Kung Fu Panda, Hannah Montana, and the Chipmunks, who attempt to eat everyone's testicles for some reason. Surprisingly, it is almost decently put together in a technical sense. The shots are lit and framed well, and the sound mix is serviceable, which is why the massive failure in all other areas is so much more painful, like the low-rent costumes and cheesy special effects. Imagine an hour-long episode of Family Guy containing only cutaways. Now imagine they're all five minutes too long and are embarrassing to watch. Such an experience barely begins to describe the level of ineptitude required to mangle together this piece of crap. Friedberg and Setzer are a plague on society, an obstacle for evolution, and should be permanently banned from Hollywood. This movie's only redeeming quality is how short it is, running just 75 minutes before a series of goofy bloopers pad out the 12-minute credit sequence, ending with a musical montage revisiting all of the picture's worst characters, as if to remind you of what you suffered through. I'd sooner stab my own eyes out with a rusty spork than watch this crap again. Disaster movie. An unmitigated disaster. Cringeworthy diarrhea. Now let's read some of your reviews from the YouTube comments. Here's Disaster Movie on the hate matic a double garbage. An unfunny, unwatchable movie with no redeeming features, 47% of you rated this a 1. 
The worst part about this picture is that unlike other poorly made films, this one isn't harmless. It is detrimental to society, especially when they keep earning money. I, of course, gave it my lowest possible score, a 1 out of 10. Now for tonight's poll question, though. What is the worst movie you've ever seen? One of the pictures highlighted in this episode, or something else? Leave your response as I comment below. Our third bad movie tonight is from Justin to Kelly. Released on June 20th, 2003, this romantic comedy musical film from director Robert Eisko was a box office bomb, failing to earn even $5 million against its $12 million budget. The Golden Raspberry Award winner for Worst Musical in 25 Years, this ill-advised project was a shameless cash grab on the picture's leading couple, Kelly Clarkson and Justin Guarini, the winner and runner-up of American Idol's game-changing first season, who are contractually obligated to participate. Once you get past the inventive opening credits that are textured and tracked to the in-world landscape, this movie slides downhill fast, offering nothing unique or interesting in any way. The plot features Clarkson as a cute girl next door who falls in love at first sight with Guarini, the squarny man with a perm, during spring break in Miami. One supporting player remarks on their personalities, you're the mayor of spring break and she's one bonnet shy of Amish. The chemistry between them is so lackluster, I'm honestly still undecided as to whether or not Justin's character is gay. Don't expect any surprises in the tired and familiar plot, which plays out like every other beach party adventure. But instead of getting crazy drunk, the cast sings impromptu musicals. And instead of having wild promiscuous sex, they have poorly choreographed dance numbers. Do y'all give discounts to friends of the promoters? Cause I'm ready to party. At least the movie actually has characters, dialogue, and a plot, which although paced rather leisurely, never completely drags. The humdrum sequence of events is steeped in dramatic irony and plays out like one long, boring misconnections post from Craigslist. The most upsetting issue with this film was the one you'd hope it'd get right. The music, which is mixed so poorly, the muddled and unoriginal tracks are indistinguishable from the bland background music. It's a shame to see the talents of these otherwise capable singers wasted. Only a passionate duet during the climax shows off Kelly's impressive range. And for that reason, this film is a disappointment to the only demographic that might consider watching it, diehard fans of American Idol. Impressively, this PG movie originally held the record for fastest release to home video, just 29 days after its pathetic theatrical debut. The short 81-minute picture overstays its welcome with a giant, unnecessary, and generally obnoxious musical cover of That's the Way I Like It, which is embarrassing to watch. Overall, the movie is harmless fluff with no big mistakes in any of the technical categories. The movie is hardly one of the worst ever made, but it's also entirely forgettable. An uninspired, unrealistic, poorly executed waste of time from Justin to Kelly is the antithesis of entertaining, but competent. Now let's check out some of your thoughts on this movie from the YouTube comments. From Justin to Kelly on the rate matic a double two. A slim 22% majority spared this picture from the lowest score, but still criticized the crappy acting, calling it bad. Perhaps receiving far more hate than it deserves, this is nothing more than a pointless reality TV show spinoff that should have never existed in the first place. I thought it was bad too. Next up, Manos, The Hands of Fate. Written, directed, produced by, and starring insurance salesman Harold P. Warren, this criminally incompetent exercise in horror saw limited release in November of 1966, but actual box office figures are unknown, if they ever materialized at all. After an embarrassing premiere, the movie wallowed in obscurity until gaining cult-like infamy when it was featured on a 1993 episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000. Literally made on a bet between friends, this thankfully short 74-minute feature was independently financed on a budget of 19000 and frankly, I can't believe anyone even paid to have the celluloid developed. The nonsensical and infuriatingly stupid plot revolves around a vacationing family that inadvertently stumbles upon a mysterious polygamous pagan cult in the middle of the desert, where they're greeted by Torgo, a bizarre doorman servant played by John Reynolds. The awkward and pervy character's incessant twitching and manic behavior was reportedly a result of Reynolds using LSD while filming. His drugged out and creepy acting is certainly the most memorable aspect of this train wreck, which will either have you laughing unintentionally or falling asleep from boredom. 
The misguided but dedicated vision of Warren was filmed entirely handheld, almost exclusively with poorly framed wide shots, sans diegetic audio, and backed by music so distracting it sounds worse than a low-rent porno. All of the actors' voices were dubbed, rather poorly in post-production, by only three people, resulting in confusing conversations where characters basically are talking to themselves, noticeably out of sync as well. Oh, Mike, I'm scared. He has the meanest look. That dog. I'd hate to run up on them in the dark, or even in the light for that matter. That must be your master. Where did you say he was? He has left this world. But he is with us always. No matter where we go, he is with us. Beginning with unnecessarily long establishing shots and driving footage intended to have opening credits over them, this unrated picture is intrinsically fascinating in how truly inept it is in every phase of filmmaking. Ironically, this unbearably bad movie should be applauded, as it inherently forces you to value the meaning of life, and why you're wasting it on a piece of junk like this. Technically speaking, you couldn't produce a worse project if you rubbed excrement on the lens and ran belching audio for 80 minutes which, now that I think of it, is actually the plot of Disaster Movie. The extremely unrealistic and weird dialogue is astonishingly abysmal, delivered by cringeworthy performances, separated by long awkward pauses, foolish jump cuts, continuity errors, and blocking decisions that'll make your head spin. From the pointless non sequitur developments like an unrelated couple repeatedly featured making out in their car, to a hilarious scene where Torgo is seemingly massaged to death, the execution is indescribably awful, containing only enough material to last maybe five minutes if it wasn't so horridly paced. In the long and storied history of cinema, never before or since has a movie been so insufferable, completely devoid of anything interesting, except for an unintentional quaintness that makes it a curiosity piece. Manos, The Hands of Fate, the worst movie ever made. At least it's all uphill from here, though. Now let's see what you had to say in the YouTube comments. Our scores for Manos, The Hands of Fate, a double one. A full two-thirds of everyone who voted ranked this picture a two or lower, as it was just plain difficult to watch. You thought it was garbage. Now technically, an all-zero score shouldn't be possible, but for Manos, I'm willing to make an exception. Perhaps there's a more terrible film out there, but I haven't seen it. I thought this film was garbage, the absolute worst. Finally tonight, let's review Super Babies, Baby Geniuses 2. The unnecessary sequel to a bad film that nobody asked for, this Bob Clark production was released on August 27, 2004, and failed to earn back even half of its $20 million budget. Beginning innocently enough, the simplistic plot introduces us to four intelligent toddlers capable of communicating with one another. The crux of the drama hinges on an incredibly lazy MacGuffin that, surprise, accidentally gets lost by the bad guys, and they don't have a backup. Decent, but often creepy-looking visual effects ensure the baby's mouths move when they talk, but it ultimately feels like an E-Trade commercial that lasts 88 minutes. The cast includes Vanessa Angel, Skylar Shea, Scott Baio, and John, Academy Award winner Voight, as the primary villain. Why on earth would such an accomplished actor agree to star in this awful project? Was he held at gunpoint? The material is below even Baio's standards, and Voight's involvement, much like his boring performance, is frankly embarrassing. Leo, Jerry, and Miles Fitzgerald are triplet child actors interchanged as the film's hero, whom, despite the picture's title, were actually eight years old during filming. Their performances aren't even serviceable for kids doing 33% of the work. Forced to deliver terrible lines of dialogue like, I'm your worst nightmare, a small fry with a big attitude, while doing flips and kicks around an office room. The pointless fight scenes between the toddlers and adults bounce from Three Stooges style slapstick to crouching tiger wall walking takedowns. On a related note, a midget with a bad wig is a poor and rather obvious stunt double for the child actors. I'm intrigued. What is your last word? Duck. Duck is your last word. Duck. The machine has damaged my leg. Get him! What are you waiting for? Bottle. Get him before he... No!
Going on for what seems like an eternity, the stale cinematography, generic soundtrack, and immature sound effects are best if avoided. Ultimately, it borrows from a concept far better executed in the Look Who's Talking trilogy. Except here, Clark has missed the mark. If the PG picture is intended for children, why are there jokes about Mike Tyson biting people's ears off? After a jerky crane shot reveals the Super Baby's unimpressive mountain hideout beneath the Hollywood sign, their nemeses are forced to suffer the ultimate fate falling backwards into a shallow mode of water, as if getting wet is a deterrent for global domination. With less urgency than a lie at the DMV, this pathetic excuse for cinema crawls into the final minutes by actually advocating against itself, when the concept of turning off the TV and going outside becomes a moral victory for the characters. And it seems like good advice if you want to avoid this picture. A hackneyed Casablanca quote is an insulting final blow for anyone foolish enough to watch to the end. An unrealistic, unwatchable, boring, and tepid piece of garbage, Super Baby's Baby Geniuses 2 is a pathetic embarrassment, painfully stupid nonsense. Now let's check out your thoughts from the YouTube comments. Super Babies, Baby Geniuses 2 on the hate o -matic. Another pair of ones. In a word, you thought this film was simply stupid. You rated it a garbage. I think what's most upsetting about this picture is the presence of normally talented and rational individuals. Their participation in this crap fest makes the movie all the more perplexing and disappointing. I too thought it was garbage. Now let's take a look at what's currently playing in theaters with some of your tweet critiques. If you see a new movie in theaters, tweet your review with the JPM and hashtag to have it featured on the show. Next week on the season four finale of Movie Night, I'll be doing something I've never done before, reviewing four brand new pictures in the same episode, including one that hasn't even been released yet. Star Trek Into Darkness, the mammoth sequel to 2009's successful reboot of the Star Trek franchise, Fast and Furious 6, the latest action extravaganza from the long-running racing franchise, the Hangover Part 3, the highly anticipated end to the R-rated comedy trilogy, and Now You See Me, an upcoming magician-themed heist picture with an ensemble cast. If you have a chance to see these films before next week, share your opinions, either by voting in the polls below or by leaving a comment review. And please subscribe to the Movie Night Archive channel for my exclusive trailer commentaries and an organized library of all our past reviews. Once again, my name is Jonathan Paula. Thank you for watching Movie Night over these past 100 episodes. I hope to see you right back here for the next episode.